My father died because our house was infested with ladybugs. Our French neighbors, the Perus, had imported a hardy species of the insect to combat aphids in their garden. The ladybugs bred and migrated. Hundreds upon hundreds were living in our curtains, our cabinets, the ventilation system. At first, we thought it was hilarious and fitting for us to be plagued by something so cute and benign. But these weren't nursery rhyme ladybugs, not the adorable shiny red and black beetles. These ladybugs were orange. They had uneven brown splotches. When I squished their shells between my thumb and forefinger, they left a rust-colored stain on my skin and an acrid smell that wouldn't wash off. Dad used a vacuum hose to suck up the little arch creatures, but they quickly replaced themselves. The numbers never dwindled. Dad must have smoked a lot of pot before he climbed the ladder to our roof. My guess is that he wanted to cover the opening of the chimney. He'd suspected that the flue wasn't closed all the way. Our house was three stories high. When he fell, he landed on the Haru cement patio, his skull fractured, his neck broken. For months after his death, I kept finding the ladybugs everywhere. When I stripped my bed, I'd find them in the sheets. When I did laundry, I'd find their dead carapaces in the dryer. When I woke up in the morning, I'd find a pair scuffling along my freshly laundered pillowcases. Then, just like that, they were gone. Long after the last ladybug's departure, I pulled a pair of sunglasses from my mom's purse on the car seat, fogged the lenses with my breath, rubbed the plastic eyes against my chest, and said to her, you missed the scenic overlook. Mom swiped her sunglasses away from me. There will be other stops, Elise, she said. We were driving through the Texas Hill Country in an upgraded rental car, cruising a roadway called the Devil's Backbone. Our destination, LBJ, his ranch, his reconstructed birth site. The rental car guy had flashed a brilliant smile when he bumped us up from a white Taurus to a monster green SUV. Mom couldn't resist bullying the skinny clerk. No one screws me on gas mileage. I'm not paying extra to fuel that obscenity. As the car clerk hammered his keyboard and readjusted the price, Mom winked at me. My mother, the investment banker, Every morning, well before dawn, she would maneuver her own Ford Explorer across the George Washington Bridge into Manhattan, cell phoning her underlings while cutting off other commuters. Mom called her first-year analysts meat and bragged that she, in turn, was known as the lion. Mom always wore her long, straightened red hair loose and down her back. She'd sport short skirts and sleeveless dresses, showing off her sculpted calves and biceps. Mom specialized in M&As, corporate restructuring, and bankruptcy. She traveled a lot. Dad had brainstormed our presidential sightseeing tours as a way for him to keep me entertained while Mom flew off to Chicago and Denver, dismantling pharmaceutical corporations along the way. I really think we were supposed to stop at that overlook, I said. We coasted past juniper trees, live oaks, limestone cliffs. As far as I could tell, the whole point of driving the Devil's Backbone was to stop at that particular overlook and view the span of gently sloping hills from the highest vantage point. Dad would have turned back, I said. Mom just kept driving. I passed the time by reading snippets from the Lonely Planet Guide to Texas and rattling off the names of local towns, Wimberley, Comfort, and Bernie. I flipped down the sun visor, replated my French braids in the vanity mirror. I wore my favorite outfit, red high top sneakers, baggy khaki shorts, and a t-shirt I had special ordered at a mall in Teaneck, New Jersey. For $28, a man from Weehawken had ironed black velvet letters onto the front of a tiny green jersey. The letters spelled out victim. When my mom asked how I got off being so self-pitying, I told her it was the name of my favorite underground band. The Devil's Backbone reminded me of the shingle sore tormenting my lower torso. The giant scab resembled a hard red shell. 
The family doctor had explained how sometimes chickenpox virus remains dormant in a nerve ending, waiting for the immune system to weaken before re-emerging. He was concerned because he'd never seen shingles in anyone my age. Usually he treated it in older patients or in cases occurring with cancer or AIDS, people closing in on death. I told mom the shingles were proof I was special. <laughs> The agony wasn't limited to the blisters on my back. My whole body felt inflamed, as if a rabid wolf were hunting rabid squirrels inside my chest. The doctor recommended ibuprofen for the pain. He gave me pamphlets describing stress-reducing breathing exercises. The first few nights, Mom slipped me half a Vicodin and a nip of Benedictine brandy. As I tried to sleep, I heard her roaming from living room to bedroom to family room. I listened. My mother, the widow, did not weep, did not cry out for her dead husband. A year after my father died, my mother's breasts began to grow. She developed a deep, embarrassing plunge of cleavage, a pendulous swinging bosom that attacked my own flat body each time she hugged me goodnight. Mom's belly had pouted, ballooned. I could detect the domed button of her navel pressing out against the soft skin of her blouses. Her ankles swelled, and I became suspicious. Mom was maybe six months into her pregnancy. I did the math. Dad had been pushing dead too long to be the father. I was about to enter my sophomore year at the Academy of Holy Angels. Before school started, I wanted the shingles on my back to disappear. I wanted to tour the reconstructed birthplace of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And I wanted my mother to admit to me that she was pregnant. With dad gone, I insisted on upholding our family's tradition of visiting presidential landmarks. Dad and I had been doing them in chronological order. We'd sightseen the big ones, Mount Vernon, Monticello, the Hermitage, Sagamore Hill. Weeks before Dad broke his neck, we'd spent a lively afternoon in the gift shop of the John Fitzgerald Kennedy Library, rubbing our faces in the soft velour of JFK commemorative golf towels. The less popular the sites, the more obscure the leader of our country, the more Dad got excited. Elise, can you imagine? John Tyler actually sat in this breakfast nook and ate soft-boiled eggs from those egg cups. In Columbia, Tennessee, I tore white azalea petals from James K. Polk's ancestral garden while Dad rambled on about the Mexican War, the Dark Horse, and 54-40 or fight. At the Albany Rural Cemetery, Dad and I knelt solemnly before the grave of Chester Allen Arthur. A giant marble angel with voluminous wings towered over us. We prayed to our favorite forgotten leader, the father of civil service reform. One year, we spent Christmas on Cape Cod at a beachside inn that had been a secret getaway for Grover Cleveland and his mistress. Mom couldn't make that trip, so Dad and I tramped by ourselves on the snow-covered sand dunes, plotting my own future run for the presidency. You need a catchphrase, he said, and a trademark hairdo so the cartoonists can immortalize you. <laughs> All day, we've been driving in various stages of silence and radio static. Mom asked whether I'd like to stop for Sundays. I considered patting her belly and making a joke about cravings for ice cream and pickles. I expected Mom to nix my travel plans for us, but really, I just wanted her to be honest and say to me, Elise, I can't fly. Not in my condition. Instead, when I said Johnson, Mom folded her arms against her burgeoning chest. She swung her hair over her shoulders and said, Texas in August? Are you kidding me? The day before, we'd visited the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas. Mom and I took the elevator up to the top of the Texas Book Depository. We slowly worked our way through the permanent exhibit dedicated to the Kennedy assassination. Through a glass window, through a glass window surrounded the actual Oswald window, Mom and I got close enough to size up the short distance between the building and the X on the street below. The X marked the spot where Kennedy was first hit. I'd always imagined Dealey Plaza as an enormous expanse of traffic and park, but here it was in front of me, tiny and green, more like a miniature replica made by a film crew. 
One SUV after another covered the X as the cars drove over the site in perpetual reenactment of Kennedy's last ride. This was the bona fide scene of the infamous crime. Mom whispered, even I could make that shot. <laughs> she hugged me from behind, and I felt the baby's heartbeat vibrate through her belly. In anticipation of our trip, I began calling my secret sibling, Lyndon. I asked, is Lyndon kicking? Mom ignored me. Weeks ago, when I'd asked her point blank if she was pregnant and quizzed her on what she intended to do with the baby, instead of answering the question, she told me that her new goal in life was to get me away from the fucking holy angels. Sorry for swearing. <laughs> Dad was the Catholic. Mom's family had come over on the Mayflower. At least, she'd say, a lot of Yankees brag about tracing their roots back. Always be conscious of your place in history. Most of the people on that ship were poor. Your relatives were the lucky ones with money. Before her parents divorced and squandered everything, my mother grew up rich in Manhattan. Her childhood bedroom had a view of the sheep meadow and the Central Park Reservoir. Both of mom's doormen were named Fritz. When she turned six, her folks hired Richard Avedon to take the snapshots at her birthday party. At 16, she'd curtsied before Princess Grace at a charity fundraiser for retired racehorses. I often felt as though Dad and I were descended from one class of people while Mom hailed from another class entirely. My father sold pies for a living. Nominally, he was the vice president of the Pie Piper, his parents' international bakery corporation, but mostly what Dad chose to do was drive his pie truck around the tri-state area, checking and restocking Safeways and Star Markets, shelving lemon cream, coconut dream, and chocolate meringue pies. Dad had a jacket with Teamster embroidered on the back. He liked to brag that he knew the fastest routes in and out of Manhattan at any point during the day. He knew when best to take the Lincoln Tunnel. Dad felt that my aristocratic heritage and working class lineage would make me an ideal political candidate. He cast me as a liberal Democrat and cast himself as my campaign manager. Dad first ran me in third grade for homeroom line leader. I lost to Endora Rose, whose mother on election day made two dozen chocolate cupcakes with pink rosebuds in the center. Dad viewed this loss as a tactical oversight. Our future campaigns always involved the pie piper donating dozens of pies and pastries to holy angels. In fifth grade, I was class treasurer. In seventh grade, I was student representative to the Advisory Council on redesigning our school uniforms. Dad imagined I would win the governorship of New Jersey, and from there, if I could find the right Southern running mate, become the first woman president of the United States. I was 12 the afternoon I caught Dad sprawled out on the Philadelphia Chippendale, one hand holding a silver lighter, the other hand cradling a short ceramic pipe. There had been a bomb scare at Holy Angels, and the nuns had grudgingly sent us home early. Dad was wearing his boxer shorts and watching a rerun of The Joker's Wild. <laughs> he flung a cashmere blanket over his lap, swung his legs off my mother's 200-year-old sofa, and said, Honey, come meet James Buchanan. I sat beside my bare-chested father, his blonde hair flattened on one side, and watched him twirl his pipe around. Made this in college art class. The clay morphed in the kiln. He showed me the blunt end of the pipe. Looks just like our bachelor president. His first lady was his niece, handsome fellow. On the TV, Wink Martindale exclaimed, Joker, Joker, Joker. Dad smiled. Don't worry, your mom has seen me smoke. My father confided to me that he'd had panic attacks as a kid. I'd be paralyzed with knocked out with it. The only thing that helped was reading almanacs. <laughs> Dad memorized historical facts, like the years each president served in office, and he'd repeat these dates in an effort to calm himself. Zachary Taylor, 1849-1850, Rutherford Bertrard Hayes, 1877-1881, Franklin Pierce, 1853 to 1857. At 15, Dad discovered pot. I loved sitting in the living room while Dad choked up. Marijuana haze drifted around me, settling on the folds of my wool-pleated skirt. 
I lean my neck down against my Peter Pan collar and catch the wonderful stink of weed lingering against my blouse. I was a nervous kid. I often threw up before big tests. No one at Billy Angels invited me to sleepovers anymore on account of my loud, thrashing night terrors. Even my closest friend, Alana Clinton, often insisted I take a chill pill. I'd attempted hypnosis therapy to treat the warts in my hands, the muscle spasms in my left eye, the mysterious rashes that appeared across my stomach, my inner ear imbalance, my tooth grinding problem. Only breathing in my father's pot smoke truly relaxed me. He never let me inhale directly from Buchanan, but he granted me a contact high. Afterward, the two of us would split one of my father's ancestral peach pies. This happened once or twice a week. Mom didn't know. Mom and I pulled off the devil's backbone and stopped for soft serve at a place called the Frozen Armadillo. <laughs> she got a chocolate and vanilla twist with cherry flavored dip, and I ordered a vanilla cone covered in something advertised as Twinkle Coat. Outside in the August heat, the ice cream dripped down our arms. We decided to eat the cones in the air conditioned rental car. I told Mom my theory about LBJ and the Kennedy assassination. I was convinced that Lyndon was the real culprit. Nothing that big could happen in Texas without Lyndon's approval. Motive is obvious, I said. Who gains the most from Kennedy dying? LBJ gets to be president. Who's responsible for the investigation and subsequent cover-up? LBJ gets to appoint the Warren Commission. There's proof that LBJ actually knew Jack Ruby. All Lyndon ever wanted was to be president, not vice president. He was an old man. Time was running out. I told my mother that there had been talk of Kennedy dropping LBJ from the ticket in 64. How do you know so much, she asked. It's dad's fault, I said. She said, you know, your father always wanted to be a high school history teacher. What stopped him, I asked. Well, sweetie, mom said, wiping ice cream off my nose. Convicted felons aren't allowed to teach children. Mom balanced her own ice cream cone against the steering wheel and turned on the ignition. She headed out toward Johnson City. We drove past brown, sandy hills crowned by patches of cacti with round, thorned leaves. Take it back, I told her. What you said, take it back. You shouldn't idealize your father. You didn't know him as well as you like to think. From the looks of it, I pointed to Mom's belly, Dad didn't know you at all. I was deciding between calling my mother a bitch and calling her a fucking bitch <laughs> when she chucked the rest of her ice cream cone at the side of my face. The ice cream splattered against my hair and cheek. The wafer cone landed on the side of my leg. I picked it up and threw it back at her. I pulled the top of my own ice cream off its cone and aimed for mom's chest. She shrieked, swerving the car and throwing back at me whatever clumps of ice cream she could pull from her cleavage. <laughs> we each lost sense of our target, hurling any ice cream slop we could get hold of. The car's green cloth upholstery and side windows clattered over in a sticky cherry-flavored film. Chocolate ice cream melted in streams down Mom's chest. The black velvet letters on my victim t-shirt soaked up my dessert. Mom drove and swore. She called me ungrateful and threatened to leave me right there on the spine of the devil's backbone. Mom didn't notice the bend in the road. She screamed in confusion as our car lurched through a very real white picket fence, careening down a hill and into an orchard. She pumped and locked the brakes just in time for us to hit a patch of peach trees. The airbags did not work. No explosion of white pillow. In that brief instant, as I watched the seatbelt jerk mom back and hold her safely in place, I thought of how the pressure and force of the airbag would have crushed mom's belly, crippling Lyndon, killing the start of him. Mom saved me from the windshield by holding her right arm out straight against my chest. Holy fuck, she said. Mom surveyed me. Are you all right, she asked. We got out of the car together, the two of us still dripping with ice cream. We marveled at the damage. A peach tree appeared to be growing out of the hood of our rental car. Mom picked up a pink and yellow fruit, brushing the fuzz against her lips before taking a bite. You and your presidents, she said. That's it. I'm through. And you can be damn sure I'm not taking you to your Belinda. There's no fucking way I'm visiting Nixon. <laughs> 
I insisted on hiking the remaining mile and a half to the LBJ Ranch. The car was not my problem. I was a kid, and this was my summer vacation. I stayed 100 yards in front of my mother. She played with her cell phone the entire time, dialing and redialing numbers. From her loud cursing, I could tell that there was no service, no way to call a tow truck or taxi, no way to complain to her mystery lover about me. I imagined my mother had many young lovers. For all I knew, she didn't know who Lyndon's father was. I didn't want to think about the lion having sex. I wanted to remember the Saturday mornings when I'd wake up early, sneak into my parents' room, and burrow a narrow tunnel between their sleeping bodies. I traced the beauty marks on mom's back, naming the largest ones. With the tips of my fingers, I'd smooth out the worry lines on my father's forehead. Their bed was an enormous life raft. I would imagine that the three of us were the last family left in the world. I loved my parents best when they were asleep, and I was standing guard. On the LBJ tour bus, the man sitting closest to the door stood up to give my mother his seat. She smiled and said, not necessary. We'd taken turns washing up ourselves in the ladies' room of the park's visitor center. While mom pulled knots of peanut twinkle coat from her hair, I watched a short film about the ranch, the birthplace, and the family cemetery. The birthplace wasn't really the birthplace. The original birthplace had been torn down. LBJ actually had a facsimile of the house rebuilt during his presidency. He decorated the house in period pieces, but none of the furnishings were original except for a rawhide cushion chair. The film showed Lyndon in a cowboy hat and sports coat, posing on the front porch of his make-believe home. Dad would have loved the film. He would have leaned over and repeated the story about LBJ and the goat fucker. Do you know about LBJ and the goat fucker, I said to Mom? When Johnson first ran for office, he told his campaign manager to spread a rumor that his opponent had sex with farm animals. When the manager pointed out that this wasn't true, Johnson said, so what? Force the bastard to admit, I never fucked a goat. <laughs> It'll be rude. You curse like your father, Mom sighed. The reconstructed birthplace was the first stop in the tour. The park ranger bus driver was a chatty older woman named Cynthia. She bounced around the bus taking our tickets, sporty and spry in her light green ranger's uniform. A row of bench seats ran along each side of the bus facing a wide center aisle. Another row of seats ran along the back. There were nine other people on the bus, the polite man closest to the door, a pair of elderly identical twin sisters who wore matching red windbreakers, a middle-aged German couple toting two large canvas backpacks and a family of four. The mother and father of the family laughed as their young daughter hugged her baby brother and scooped him up onto her lap. The little blonde boy had a crazy cowlick I wanted to flatten and fix. Mom and I sat in the very back row, several seats apart from each other. As we drove past the banks of the Pernelles River, Cynthia described the lawn chair staff meetings Lyndon held at his ranch during Vietnam. She told us that Lady Bird had kindly donated all of the land in the ranch to the National Park Service, but chose to live part-time in the main ranch house. My shingle sore was rubbing against my t-shirt, the pain ratcheting up inside of me. I was still angry at Mom. I held my breath to calm myself and ran through dates. Andrew Johnson, 1865, 1869, Benjamin Harrison, 1889, 1893, Warren Harding, 1921 and 1923, Mom leaned over and said, Lady Bird is shrewd. Putting the ranch into a trust is an excellent way of avoiding taxes. <laughs> we drove past lazy orange and white hair for cattle grazing by the river. An ibex shot out from behind a sycamore tree, and then another ibex followed, and another. The cows ignored the elegant brown and white horned antelopes. Cynthia said, Lady Bird also runs an exotic animal safari on the ranch. As exotic animals are legal in Texas, hunters can pay the Johnson family to come and stalk rare creatures from the dark continent. My mother whispered, Lady Bird's a genius. I'd always thought that Dad liked Mom because her mother's maiden name was Van Buren. One afternoon, my father told me how he and Mom began dating. You have to be careful with this information. He said, your mother doesn't know the whole story. My parents met their freshman year in college, the same day dad met mom. He also met another woman, a sculpture major named Liesel. 
She had wavy black hair, a German accent, and an apartment off campus. Dad liked both women and was stuck deciding whether to pursue Mom or Liesel. He decided to go after Liesel. He was dressed up and on his way to meet the German sculptress for their first serious date when he bumped into Mom. She'd been playing rugby and she was totally covered in mud and sweat. She asked me if I wanted to take a shower with her. I went back to her dorm. Dad smiled. And that's the moment when my life began. He said something else about mom being a sexy lady, but I clutched my hands to my ears and locked him out. The reconstructed birthplace was white with green shutters. It was small, just two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a breezeway. Cynthia showed us the bedroom where Johnson was birthed. A queen-size bed dominated the room. I noticed long, shiny black beetles crawling over the chenille bedspread. One of the beetles flew up and circled past me. Cynthia said, his mother claimed that he had it wrong. She kept insisting that Lyndon was actually born in the smaller bedroom, but LBJ was adamant. In the kitchen, I saw the rawhide chair, the one authentic piece. I wanted to run my hand over the cow fur. Right by the kitchen table stood a baby's wooden high chair with ladybird etched across the back seat. Cynthia said that the first lady had been kind enough to donate her own Roy Crofter high chair for the replica. Mom mouthed Lady Bird to herself and rested her hands on her belly. I pictured a plump, kicking baby fidgeting in the chair. Mom, if you want, I said, I could steal the high chair for you. <laughs> What's a Lady Bird, Mom asked Cynthia. A Lady Bird is what we in the South call ladybugs. Mom looked at me. She shook her head. Those little killers. <laughs> Sometimes when I hung out with my dad while he smoked Buchanan, I'd get paranoid. The nuns at school loved bullying girls, and though I understood in theory how women got pregnant, the immaculate conception confused and disturbed me. I imagined invisible sperm floating through the ether, landing on my leg, and inching up my holy angel's uniform. Once I even imagined being pregnant with dad's baby, but I couldn't imagine anything after that. In her grief, mom had fucked someone. Maybe the lion had some meat after all. She probably couldn't explain her own pain over losing dad, at least not to me. I knew harboring a baby while I looked on could only make her feel alone. While he was alive, mom was certain I loved dad more than her. The two of you have your own secret society, she'd say. Now that he was dead, mom was convinced I'd love the memory of him more than I'd ever love her. I wanted to tell her she was dead wrong, but I wasn't sure that she was. The Johnson family graveyard was nothing more than a small plot of land squared off by a stone wall, stood straight across from the birthplace. In the August heat, Mom and I wandered over to the cemetery. Cynthia and our busmates were still loitering beside the house. Mom told me that Dad had been arrested before I was born. He'd been pulled over for speeding in his pie truck. The cop noticed a bag of pot in the ashtray, a very big baggie of pot. Dad was arrested, tried, and found guilty of possession with intent to distribute. Your grandfather could have made the whole thing go away, but instead he let your father do six months in prison. Minimum security, a life lesson. I was pregnant with you the whole time he was locked up. Mom tucked a wisp of loose hair behind my left ear. I figured you should know about your father's past, you know, for your political career. I wanted to tell her that I was sorry. As much as I loved my father, I was mystified as to why mom, who worked 90 hours a week, would stay married to a man who was happiest when lying down on a couch, a man who couldn't keep his balance on the roof of his own house, a man who could never find his wallet or remember to tie his shoes, a man who panicked every time the phone rang. I would never understand how she had come to love him. I'm sorry about the rental car, I said. Insurance will cover it. Mom and I looked out at the family gravestones, the tallest one, was Lyndon's. Honey, she said, your dad was a wonderful, frustrating, lovely, ridiculous man.